Welcome to Ink Tank's webinar, Getting Started with Steps. I am Danielle Womble, Director of Marketing at Ink Tank, your moderator and webinar organizer. Before we start, let's take a moment to ensure that everyone is familiar with the webinar control panel. At the top of the slide panel, you will find four buttons. These buttons can be used to ask a question, answer voting questions, view attachments with additional related material, and also allows you to rate the webinar and leave us feedback. Please feel free at any time during the webinar to ask a question and to leave feedback, as these are important to us. Thank you for joining the first webinar, which is part of a webinar series that we will, will, that we will be running over the next couple of weeks. Today's topic is getting started with Steph. During this webinar, we will introduce you to Steph in Ink Tank, discuss the technology foundation of Steph, and walk through how you can get started using Steph. Now I'd like to turn it over to Miroslav Klavinsky. Technical Marketing Engineer at Ink Tank. Thank you, Danielle. Um, as Danielle mentioned, we're going to talk about getting started with Ceph. Uh, hopefully, some of you have heard about Ceph, but if you haven't, you know we'll provide an overview. Uh, here's the agenda for our webinar. First, we'll talk a little bit about Ceph and Ink Tank. Then we'll provide an overview of the Ceph technology go through a getting started walkthrough showing the steps of what you could do to get started and get hands-on experience using Ceph. Um, we will also have attachments after the webinar and, uh, that provide a more detailed guide for that walkthrough. And then a review resources and next steps. Okay, so if you haven't heard of Ceph and Ink Tank, Ceph is a distributed unified object block and file storage platform. It's been created by storage experts as open source software, and it's been integrated with the Linux kernel for several years now. Um, it's also integrated into various cloud management platforms, for example, like OpenStack and other cloud management platforms as well. Uh, we'll talk a little bit later on about what makes Ceph unique and a really cool technology. Ink Tank is the company that Danielle and I work for. We're a company that provides professional services and support for Ceph. It was founded in 2011 and seed funded by DreamHost and Mark Shuttleworth. The CTO is Sage Weil, who is the creator of Ceph technology. Sage started working on Ceph probably back in 2005, 2006. So Ceph itself is a technology that's been part of the open source community for a while and has already matured to the point where we're comfortable recommending it for production deployments. Um, when Ceph was being conceived and developed, there are a number of different principles that were kept in mind as important for developing this technology. So things like every component must scale, there can't be any single points of failures, the solution must be software-based so that it can be flexibly adapted to a number of different environments, including appliances, but not be an appliance itself. And it has to run on readily available commodity hardware. Because it's going to be deployed at scale and in situations where there can't always be an administrator handy, it has to be self-managing whenever possible. And one term that I've heard in the past is rot in place. The idea is when something fails, you just leave it there and you have enough redundancy in the overall system that everything keeps working. When you have some time to go in and swap fail disks or replace components, then you can do that maintenance. But the system itself is architected in such a way that it can be autonomous for a good chunk of its independent runtime. And finally, this has to be an open source solution, not only so that the community can contribute and help make the product better more rapidly, but so that the technology gets deployed in many different areas and helps transform the storage marketplace. So what are some of the key differences between Ceph and some of the other open source storage solutions that are out there? Well, probably the most important one is the CRUSH data placement algorithm. If you go on the Ceph website, you'll see a number of different papers uh, from Sage's PhD work 
that talk about the CRUSH algorithm in a lot of detail, so if you want to learn all about it, you can. But at a very high level, CRUSH is a data placement algorithm that can replace having to manage centralized metadata. So instead of having to keep track of where all the different pieces of data are, we can compute them on the fly using CRUSH. And in addition to being able to compute them rather than having to store all that information, CRUSH is also intelligent about the infrastructure. So when disks are inserted into the overall Ceph system, they can be tagged relative to where that disk lives in terms of which node it's in, what rack, what row in the data center, what switches it's connected to, you know, even what power supply fault zone or fire protection fault zone it's in. All of that can be encoded in the infrastructure map. And then CRUSH will intelligently place and replicate objects so that every object is protected across multiple zone failures, or at least no single point of failure will be able to lead to any kind of data loss. So that's CRUSH. One of the other things that makes Ceph unique is that as an open source technology, it's a unified storage platform. So Ceph can provide object with virtual block devices, or, or objects with object placement, block with virtual block devices, and then also a distributed scalable file system. Um, there's other open source solutions out there that provide one or another but uh, Ceph is really the first complete, mature solution that provides all three. Um, we mentioned the block device. One of the things that Ceph provides that has been leveraged in a number of different solutions is a thinly provisioned virtual block device that has you know, some very compelling enterprise-style features like thin provisioning, the ability to do um, allocate on write snapshots, and uh, volume cloning. So this is part of Ceph. It's also been integrated with OpenStack, CloudStack, and a number of other technologies that lets uh, KVM and QMU take advantage of the Ceph virtual block device. And finally, uh, the Ceph file system, you know, it, it's file systems are complex, especially distributed file systems. This is still kind of evolving as a complete solution, but one of the things that Ceph provides is CephFS, which provides distributed scalable metadata servers. So you can deploy multiple metadata servers that all work in parallel, and they actually dynamically share and shift the burden of who manages which meta metadata to allow very large-scale clusters to be deployed. In terms of use cases, you know, here is just kind of a a popular sampling. In the object use case, people have used Ceph to build archival and backup storage, use it for primary object data storage. There's a S3 and Swift compatible gateway component that I'll mention a little bit more later, and that can provide a Amazon S3-like storage services on top of Ceph. People have used it to build web service platforms and also for application development. If you're developing applications for, let's say, Amazon, then you can use Ceph as a private cluster for application development. Uh, on the block side, you know, people have used it for SAN replacement using Ceph block devices either natively with their Linux applications or re-exporting them using iSCSI or as virtual block devices for VM images in um, cloud management platforms and also just virtualization environments. From the file system side, people have used it for HPC or really any kind of POSIX compatible application. So now let's take a look at Ceph technology in a little bit more depth. This diagram shows the key architectural components that are available when Ceph is employed, uh, deployed and implemented. At the base is the Ceph object storage layer. It's called RADOS, so some of the other names are kind of RADOS something. RADOS stands for Reliable Autonomous Distributed Object Store, and it's basically a massively scalable, self-healing, self-managing foundation of object storage. And the 
the key observation is that when you're building distributed complex storage systems, it's much better to start with intelligent extensible objects than dumb disks and blocks. And by starting with objects, we can do things like ask those objects to replicate to their peers, like a peer-to-peer -peer network. Um, and the crush algorithm also distributes some of the work to the clients themselves that can use the map. And I'll talk a little bit about that later on. But basically, Rados provides that object storage foundation. On top of that is that blue block on the left-hand side, which is Librados. And Librados provides a application library that developers can use to integrate their applications directly with Rados. They can take advantage of the distributed object storage capabilities of the Rados layer. Um, there are SDKs for C, C++, Python, Perl, you know, you name it, there's probably a SDK or a set of libraries already available for it. So if what you're looking for is to build a dedicated distributed application, Ceph can serve as that foundation. But most people end up using Ceph through one of the other three paths listed on the slide. So I mentioned the Rados gateway. This is a RESTful S3 and Swift compatible gateway that allows RESTful API calls to be made to the gateway and then on the back end quickly translated into native Rados calls. Um, so if you're working with Amazon S3, for example, and you want your own private cloud in-house that behaves very similar to how Amazon's cloud behaves, the Rados gateway is an easy way to implement the S3 component. I mentioned RBD, which is the Ceph block device. This is a reliable and fully distributed block device. It has enterprise features, and it's also been integrated with both the Linux kernel and like KVM and QMU on the virtualization hypervisor side. And finally, there's the CephFS client, which is also integrated with the, the Linux kernel. There's also a Fuse version of the file system client. So, you know, we're doing some work with the community to make that Fuse, cl uh, Fuse client work, let's say, on Macs and other non-Linux environments. And that's the high-level picture. One of the key things about Rados is that there are two main players in making Rados work. One is the monitors, and the monitors are the ones that manage the map of the cluster that know where all the different object stores or the disks are. So it basically provides consensus on the state of the cluster, and because of that, we need to have an odd number of monitors. Uh, three is the minimum we'd recommend for production or that we require for production, I should say. And, um, you know, if you have a cluster with more than a couple of hundred nodes, it might make sense to go from three to five, or if you have many different fault zones that you want to be able to manage, it might also make sense to go to five monitors or something else like that. But in general, the monitors are for managing the, the cluster map. Um, the component that scales and shows up most often are these Rados storage nodes, which we call OSDs, or object storage demons. So in our best practices, there's a one-to-one -one map between an object storage daemon and a disk that that daemon manages. So we recommend at least three nodes in the cluster for production. The, uh, the OSDs effectively serve the stored objects to the clients, but they also turn that dumb disk into an intelligent object store or an intelligent object service. So those OSDs can do things like replicate to their peers um, and understand when a peer is down and it needs to replicate to a new location based on an updated cluster map. Um, one of the other cool things about OSDs is that they are extensible. So in the same way that in programming you can extend a object class with new methods, you can extend OSDs with new methods that are defined using Live Rados. And, you know, for example, if your 
objects are images and you want to generate thumbnails of those images, you can extend the object class with, or the objects with a new method that when called will compute the thumbnail for that object and return the thumbnail rather than the full resolution image. So that's one of the things that makes OSDs powerful as a foundation. On this slide, we see a uh, picture of what the cluster looks like. Toward the top, we see what a Rados node would be, where there is a disk layer, some kind of file system, and you know we do extensive testing with ButterFS, XFS, and EXT4. And on top of that is the object storage daemon that then presents that the space on that disk as an intelligent object store. Um, many of those OSD nodes and monitors are gathered together to create the Rados cluster. The monitors maintain a map of the cluster. And if something changes in that cluster, then the map gets updated and propagated to all the OSDs and also all the clients that are using the cluster. So those events tend to be relatively rare, effectively only when something fails or something new is added to the cluster. So the map updates tend to happen very quickly relative to map changes. Okay, so that's really the overview. And now as uh, Danielle presented in the introduction, uh, we have a couple of questions that we're hoping you can vote for. So, you know, please use the vote button on your screen and vote on these three questions. Okay, so hopefully that was enough time. Um, if not, you can really vote at any point during this presentation. It doesn't have to be just while that slide is up. Okay, and now we're kind of going to jump into the, the technical details of this talk. And um, this is effectively an a extended walkthrough of what it's like to get started and get Ceph up and running. And to do that, I'm basically just going to be talking about some of the steps and maybe some command snippets that are useful. As I mentioned, we will have the actual detailed guide that corresponds to this walkthrough available as an attachment to this webinar um, probably, you know, within a few days of today up on the website. Uh, Danielle will send out an announcement when all the materials are available as attachments and you can access them later on. Okay, so as an overview of what we'll cover, um, we're going to be using VirtualBox. It's a pretty powerful um, hypervisor platform, and it's also free. It's available on a number of different OSs and platforms, so it seems like a really great common foundation to use. Um, but if you have other hypervisor platforms that you like, they should work just as well. This is pretty agnostic relative to the hypervisor. Um, and one of the key things to note is to simplify the walkthrough, we've relaxed some security best practices to, be, to speed things up. And um, in this walkthrough that I'm going to present today, I've omitted those security setup steps. They're in the guide. And, um, you know, it, if you have questions, you can ask them. And, you know, we, we'll be able to address them offline, even if we don't really get a chance to address them live during this presentation. Um, in terms of the actual steps, what we'll do is talk about creating the VirtualBox VMs, preparing those VMs for creating the Ceph cluster, the steps to install Ceph on all the VMs from the client uh, node or the client VM, configuring Ceph on all the ser server nodes and the client, and then once Ceph is up and running and configured, we're going to experiment with the virtual block device and the distributed file system. And the final step is to unmount, stop Ceph, and shut down all the VMs safely so that you can bring them back up again sometime later on. Okay. 
So to create the VMs, what we really recommend is, um, you know, something relatively slim. It's running Ubuntu Linux, so it doesn't really require a lot of resources to perform fairly well. Um, in production, you know, of course, we require a lot more resources, but for this kind of walkthrough and demo and getting started, uh, one or more CPU cores, uh, 512 megs or more of memory, we're going to be working with Ubuntu 1204, which is the LTS release and the latest updates. Um, 1210 also works, but, um, you know, we wanted to really use the LTS. VirtualBox guest add-on, so after you create the, the VM, install the VirtualBox guest add-ons, it'll kind of help simplify things, including being able to shut down the VM and kind of power off the virtual machine more easily. Um, each VM is going to have three virtual disks, all of them dynamically allocated or thin provisioned so that they don't take up space. If you have SSDs to build this on, it makes things much quicker and more responsive. It doesn't really require a lot of space. I think all four of the VMs that I used together I used up less than about 10 gigs of space by the end of the, the walkthrough. Um, so the first disk is the OS disk. I allocated 28 gigs. It probably used maybe three or four of that. Doesn't have to be that big. And then we created two eight gig disks that can be used for SAP data. So, you know, these become SDA, SDB, and SDC. And then two virtual network interfaces. An ETH zero interface, which is on a host only network in VirtualBox and that's going to be used for all the different communication between the Ceph client and the Ceph nodes and the Ceph nodes be amongst themselves. And then an ETH1 interface, which is on a virtual box NAT network, and that is effectively just used for getting updates and packages from the Internet. Okay. Um, since it's much easier when you have a template and you just clone that template, consider just refining this with a single template VM and then cloning it four times to create the VMs for the walkthrough. Okay. Once you have the VMs up and running, especially if you clone them, we need to go into each VM and adjust the networking settings so that we have a static IP address on the host only network and we really want to be working with static IP addresses for the Ceph nodes just since things are a little bit more stable and predictable that way. Um, so for ETH0, define a static IP address in NetMask. And for ETH1, you can let it go and use DHCP, but the key is that you want to define the gateway for that interface. Uh, in VirtualBox, all of the NAT interfaces will be 10.0. something and the gateway address for that NAT virtual, er, virtual network is dot two. So define the gateway as 10.0 dot something dot two, and that way the ETH1 port will become your gateway and, you know, you can use that to download packages and updates. Um, if you cloned your VM, you also regenerated MAC addresses, or at least, you know, that make sense so that all the MAC addresses are unique. And um, you might need to go in and adjust the persistent network naming rules so that the new MAC addresses match up to the interfaces that you want. So that those rules are in SCUDEV rules.d and then 70 persistent net rules. Um, if you didn't delete that file before you shut down your template VM, then it'll have the old MAC addresses plus the new ones. If you did delete it, it'll have just the new interfaces, but that they might not be mapped to the right Ethernet interface or the right Ethernet name, so you might need to edit that file and adjust those rules. Um, and, you know, kind of now a word about some of the security shortcuts that were taken in this walkthrough to streamline things. First, we configured a Ubuntu user, so all the work is done through a user named Ubuntu. And 
we used authorized keys so that Ubuntu can SSH to all the different machines without having to provide a password. We also added Ubuntu to the sudoers file with full access, and the guide kind of describes how to do that if um, that isn't something that you've done a bunch of times. Um, we configured root on the server nodes so that root can SSH between the nodes. This is really only required um, in the beginning when Ceph first kind of gets installed. Um, the, the, Ceph ma the make CephFS command is executed on a single node, which then reaches out to all the other nodes based on a configuration file. And it's useful if root can SSH without passwords. And um, along with that, we relaxed some of the checking for known hosts so that you don't have to keep interactively confirming when a new host is touched. And uh, finally, and this is really kind of a biggie, just to simplify a lot of the configuration and commands, we disabled the CephX authentication for the Ceph cluster. And the, it, you know, I'll show how that's done in the configuration file. So normally Ceph is built to be very secure using a Kerberos style authentication mechanism that's called CephX. But to simplify things and, you know, to avoid messing with a lot of different keys, I just kind of disabled CephX in the, uh, for this walkthrough and in the guide. Okay. So now that we know the shortcuts we took, let's take a look at some of the additional steps. Um, you know, first is we want to have name resolution working in our little toy cluster. And the easiest way to do that is to edit Etsy hosts and add your static IP addresses into Etsy hosts file. Um, you know, I like to just make it portable, so I define the local host network, and then for each individual node, I define the, the ETH0 address. So in my example, the, the host-only network I was using was 192.168.56. So all of the addresses used for this toy cluster are based on that host-only interface. In your machine, um, it might be something different, so you know, just need to check to see what it is. And then once you have that Etsy host file, copy it you know, using SCP so that it's uh, all the different machines. Okay. Once you have name resolution working, what we want to do is install the Ceph Bobtail release. So um, Ceph releases are, you know, named alphabetically after different kind of cephalopods. And, um, you know, first we had Argonaut. And the latest release, which really just kind of went out a few weeks ago, is called Bobtail. So to get that, what we're going to do is add the master key for Ceph from GitHub. So we're going to fetch the key from GitHub and add it to apt keychain. And then once that key is there, what we're going to do is uh, add the source, the, um, basically ceph.com bobtail release to the list of sources so that we can get the packages from there. And once that's ready, we're going to run sudo apt-get update to update all the information. And we're going to run this, like in this example I'm showing doing that on the first node, which I call Ceph node 1, but, you know, this needs to be executed for all of the different nodes in the cluster, including the client. And if you're running this from the client, you don't need to SSH to it, but, um, you know, you can if you want to script that. So, again, sudo apt-get update, and then sudo apt-get install Ceph. And this should download all the packages, configure them, and install them. Once that's done and Ceph is available, we need to create a Ceph configuration file. So the Ceph configuration file lives in Etsy Ceph. It's called Ceph.com. And this slide shows, you know, most of what was in that Ceph.com file. The guide kind of has the complete picture. But let me talk a little bit about the sections. There's a global definition section, and this is a section in which I've turned off all the authentication. So, you know, it says auth cluster require equals none. In a production environment, instead of none, it should say CephX for all three. And then you use key management to make sure that everything is secure. There's a general OSD section that talks about uh, OSD options. 
and here we define a journal size of about one gig. Um, tell X Adder to use OMAP for ext4. Define the makefs type for the the file system that's going to be used on the OSDs as ext4. I did that just so it's easier and ubiquitous. There's actually a really great series of blog posts about performance testing with OSDs on Ceph.com, and that outlines different advantages for different file systems and, you know, kind of when you might use ButterFS versus XFS versus ext4. But just to keep things simple in this walkthrough, I used ext4, defined some mount options for those ext4 file systems, and that's kind of the general OSD section. Now I need to define my three monitors in the cluster, and to do that, you know, I have monitor A, monitor B, and monitor C. Each one has a host name and an IP address, plus a port, which is the standard port on which monitors run in a Ceph cluster. Um, after that, we have the OSD section. So basically, for every OSD or every disk in the cluster, we want to have an OSD entry, and for that entry, we define the host where that OSD is attached and a path to the device. And in the Bobtail release, we can basically specify the path to the device and have the makesFFS command automatically format all of these OSDs and mount them and, you know, start accessing them and create all the different bits that need to be created. So it's kind of a really nice shortcut and simplification. So for each OSD, we need to have something there. I skipped a few just to save space on the slide. Once that's there, we also define an MDS, which is metadata server for the Ceph distributed file system. I'm only defining one uh, over here, and it's, you know, running on node one. So once we have that Ceph.com file, we want to make a copy of it available on every single node in the cluster. So every, every node of the cluster needs to have FCCEF, Ceph.com, and, you know, you can use SCP or uh, sudo with T to get that copy installed on all the different nodes. The guide has the, the commands for making that happen. Okay, so once we have Ceph.conf on all the different machines, we copy it to all the nodes, and now we need to create the directories that the different objects or object demons are going to be running in. And um, all the Ceph kind of working directories are under var live Ceph, and what we want to do is create a OSD directory, and under the OSD directory, a Ceph-something directory for each OSD. So OSD0 goes into Ceph-0, OSD5 goes into Ceph-5 on the correct node, right? So just note the SSH that corresponds to that maker command. So for example, we have Ceph0 and Ceph1 going on node 1, Ceph2 and Ceph3 going on node 2, Ceph4 and Ceph5 for the OSDs going on node 3. We also want to create directories for the MONs and the MDS, okay? So once we've run those uh, maker commands, and the dash P option basically creates all of the previous subdirectories if needed, uh, we're going to run the make CFFS command. And the make CFFS command is really kind of the, the critical command that does all of the creation and setup for the Ceph cluster. It's going to run on node one. So, you know, in this example, I SSH into node one, become root, and then CD into Etsy Ceph, and from inside of Etsy Ceph, run make CFFS dash A dash C with the path to the comp file dash K Ceph keyring, and this really just kind of stores the administrative key. That's useful if you're going to be turning on authentication later on. And then um, this is also pretty critical. You need the dash dash make FS flag. This is the flag that will actually force uh, makes FFS to go and format all of those OSDs and, um, you know, make them make them ready for mounting on those directories when you start Ceph. Okay, so at this point, the, the cluster is created and configured, but not yet started. The next 
step is to start the cluster. And uh, we do that using the standard Linux service command. So service, ceph a you know, start all the daemons, and then start. And what you should see is output that looks kind of like this. So you're going to get a section for each of the monitors. And, you know, I, I cut out some of the, the text. But as an example for monitor A, you'll see a message that it's starting and the note it's starting on and then some other information about it. Um, then a message about starting the MDS. And then for each OSD in the system, you're going to see a message about mounting the um, OSD file system on the appropriate bar live Ceph OSD directory, and then starting the, the Ceph object storage daemon on the node, and a little bit more information, you know, about the data in the journal. So you're going to see those messages for each of the different daemons running in the Ceph cluster. Once you started the Ceph cluster, give it a minute. You know, it's going to take a little while for all the monitors to start up, reach quorum, all the OSDs to show up, and, you know, also get checked and added into the quorum. But after a minute, run the Ceph status command. You can also use Ceph-S. And what you should be seeing is health status health underscore OK. And then you should see the monitor map showing three monitors at the IP addresses that you assigned to the nodes and a message about quorum with hopefully all three nodes in the quorum. And then for the OSD map, you should see six OSDs, two on each node. And, you know, there's going to be something, some messages about PG maps and information about the placement groups that are part of the cluster and how much space is in them and all of that. And then the final thing is the MDS map, which is a map of the metadata servers. You should have one, and it's up and active. Um, so once that's there and health is okay, you should be able to run Ceph OSD tree. And this just kind of shows an ASCII printout of the different uh, OSDs and how they're attached. So, you know, here you could see that OSD 0 and 1 is attached to node 1, and they're map to some rack, uh, which, you know, hasn't been defined because I didn't define a rack in the walkthrough, um, you know, and then there's also some root for the data center or, you know, the, the distribution. So you can define a lot more granularity for the OSDs, as I mentioned earlier, but the OSD tree command is a good way to see the, the map of your cluster. Okay, so at this point, the Ceph cluster is set up, configured, up and running, and um, it's started. We should be able to start using the Ceph services to access block device, object store, file system, what have you. And in the next couple of slides, we're just going to walk through some examples of using Ceph. When you install Ceph, you also install this RBD command. The RBD command is how we manage Ceph's virtual block devices. You know, also RADO, referred to as RADO's block device, hence RBD. So there's an LS command that lets you see which images are available. You can have multiple different pools where your images are stored, but the default pool is called RBD. So RBD images by default go into the RBD pool. And when you do RBD LS for the first time, you'll see that there's no images. You can create a new RBD image simply by using the RBD create command with the name of some LUN that you want to create. So, you know, I do RBD create my LUN and specify a size. So this is in megabytes, and, you know, this command will create a 4 gig LUN. And it should come back immediately because these LUNs are all thin provisioned by default. And, you know, I'll create the LUN. And if I run rbdls, this time with dash L, I'll see that my LUN exists and it's about four gigs in size. Okay. At this point, you know, the RBD commands effectively go out and talk to the cluster as defined in the client sep.com file and create this virtual block device. Once that's 
created, I now need to access and start using that virtual block device from the client. And I can do that using the RBD map command, because I first need to take that image from the cluster and map it into my client. So I do RBD map my LUN and specify the pool where that LUN lives. And then after I've mapped the LUN, I should be able to see which LUNs are mapped using the RBD show map command. And because these are operating on devices in my file system or in my operating system, I need to be root to run those device commands. And hence, I need sudo in front of that command. So sudo RBD show map will show me that I have mylon mapped, and it's mapped as dev RBD zero. If I do an ls on dev RBD, I should see that there's an RBD subdirectory for the pool and then an RBD zero device. Um, if I get a listing for the actual LUN, I'll see that it's a symbolic link back to this RBD zero device. And if I you know, take a look at the details for that RBD zero device, uh, I'll see that it's basically a device file. So at this point, I have a Ceph virtual block device mapped to my client and it's available as a Linux block device. The next step is to actually start using it. And to do that, I'm going to format it with a file system. And I'm going to then make a directory and um, mount that directory in, you know, the, or in the directory that I just created. So, you know, I'll do make dir mount my LUN and then sudo mount the path to my LUN onto that my LUN directory. Once that's done, I should see that, you know, I have this 4 gig disk mounted as mount my LUN or a 4 gig file system on mount my LUN. And then if I want to do some I.O. just to test that everything's working, I can DD from dev0 onto a test file in that directory, and I should see a, you know, file that I created. So I've, I've created a test file, and it's in there. So at this point, you know, we demonstrated that we can use Ceph virtual block devices from the client, and we can read and write information to that block device. Okay. The next step is we want to demonstrate the Ceph distributed file system, and in some ways that's actually easier. The Ceph file system client should be integrated with um, the Linux kernel. It should be available, especially once we've in installed Ceph, which would have installed the, the various MTS and file system tools. And what we can do is just make a directory for the Ceph distributed file system and then run mount.ceph. Okay, so to do mount dot ceph to mount the ceph file system you can do mount dash t ceph as well and then here's kind of the cool part what you want to do is specify a comma separated list of the monitor nodes so these are the nodes on which the monitor is running and as long as the monitors are in quorum they don't all have to be up if the first you know you just need to get to one but as long as one of those is up it'll return the map, and we're just going to mount the root of the file system namespace as mount my CephFS. Once that's done, if you do a DF, you should see both the LUN and the file system you created mounted, as well as the new Ceph distributed file system mounted. And the mount path should include the IP addresses of all the different monitor nodes that are associated with that file system you know, that you issued in the mount command. Um, and again, we can verify that we can write and read from that file system using DD, and, you know, that should all work pretty smoothly. So at this point, what we've done is created a Ceph cluster using virtual machines, and we've... Um, you know, exercise that cluster and demonstrated kind of unified storage capabilities by using both a thinly provisioned virtual block device as well as a distributed file system from the client. 
And the next step, or the last step, really, is just to clean things up and make sure that they're in a safe state in case you need to start things up again. And to do that, we unmount all the file systems, we unmap the block device, we stop Ceph, right? And this is kind of important. You need to issue the, um, the service Ceph A stop command and wait for all the different pieces to shut down. You'll see kind of stopping message with like kill in the name of the process that's being killed. Um, across the different nodes. So you can just trigger it on any one of the nodes that's running a monitor, and it should reach out to all the other nodes. Um, and then once Ceph has safely stopped, you can just halt the actual virtual machines using service halt stop, and the VirtualBox VM will halt and power off if you installed um, the VirtualBox guest add-ons. And then stop the client, and we're done. So. Just to review, we created VirtualBox virtual machines. We prepared those VMs for creating the Ceph cluster. We installed Ceph on all the VMs from the client, uh, configured Ceph on all the different server nodes and the clients as well using the Ceph.com file. And then we experimented with access methods using the virtual block device and the distributed file system, and then cleaned things up safely. So, you know, as I mentioned before, this is based on VirtualBox, but other hypervisors will work too. And, you know, one of the keys is we relax security best practices to speed things up, but, you know, in production, it's really a good idea to keep the security high. Um, one of the things that Ink Tank can help with is also negotiating all of the nuances of getting the security dialed in and all the Ceph authentication working smoothly. Okay, so um, that was the walkthrough. We have about 10 minutes, and uh, let's take a look at um, let's take a look at some other resources that are available for learning more. We can go um, to the Ceph website, and the documentation on Ceph is actually really excellent. I mean, it's not just because I work for Ink Tank. As open source projects go, the docs for Ceph are really superb. Um, there's also blogs from Ink Tank and other Ceph community members on the Ink Tank website and then Ceph.com. And those blogs provide some really nice in-depth write-ups of people doing things with Ceph and, uh, you know, some of them provide some really nice how-to guides and, uh, you know, places to learn more. If you're a developer or want more in-depth information, there's a number of resources available on Ceph.com, including a mailing list and an IRC channel. And uh, the final link on Gmain is really the, um, the developer list archives. So if you want to search for previous topics or conversations, uh, you know, Google will do the trick as well, but you can go and browse the archives this way. Okay, and then what's next? Um, the, the best way to learn is to try it yourself. So use the information in this webinar as a starting point. There's also a uh, getting started guide in the documentation. So this walkthrough is kind of based on that getting started guide with, um, you know, the walkthrough guide that we all attach to this webinar, providing more step-by-step -step details. And consult the Ceph docs, you know, kind of Google around the uh, mailing list archives, jump on the IRC channel to get started yourself. And then once you're kind of ready to embrace Ceph more fully and are looking to put it into production, consider Ink Tank's professional services. So we offer consulting services. Um, you know, there's a number of different services available. Technical overview will, uh, you know, have us meet with the team, explain the architecture, functionality, best practices, use cases. Um, we can walk you through the code and talk about our technology roadmap and business goals. Um, we provide an infrastructure assessment service where the Ink Tank team will conduct an in-depth on-site assessment of current storage to understand architecture and future needs. Um, and then Ink Tank engineers will can work with you to customize the solution for your business, help you implement a proof of concept, um, and that's actually a really cool way to get started with Ceph if you're not 
quite sure if you're ready to go into full production with Ceph. We can help you implement a proof of concept that's tailored to your specific application needs. Um, if you want some help implementing the solution, we can provide implementation support. And also, if you already have a production instance and you just want to fine-tune it, we can do some performance tuning with you. Um, and this is really kind of professional services. One of the other really important things that we believe is critical for production is having a supported solution, some place where you can go to access expert help really quickly. So we have pre-production support where, you know, we will provide help answering questions to help you kind of get ready for production. And then once you're in a production deployment, then we can help support your production environment with very quick access to expert help. And, you know, you can go to the Ink Tank website and look at consulting services and support services to learn a lot more about what uh, Ink Tank can do to help you take advantage of the SEF technology. One other thing that I wanted to mention is this is really just the start of a series of webinars. Uh, the next webinar is Introduction to SEF with OpenStack. You know, we've done a lot of work with the OpenStack community to integrate Ceph with OpenStack. And, um, you know, in particular, we've partnered with Dell as well and integrated Ceph with their Crowbar deployment tool that can simplify deployment of OpenStack clouds. So we'll talk a little bit about that. At the next webinar, um, the webinar number two after this is a DreamHost case study, Dream Objects with Ceph. The DreamHost um, implemented a fairly large cloud implementation, one for called Dream Objects for object storage, another one called Dream Compute for um, basically virtual cloud compute with storage. Both of them use Ceph. Altogether, there's about eight petabytes under management at DreamHost with Ceph. And um, this is, will be a case study about one of those deployments. Lastly, uh, this is a really great webinar, Advanced Features of Ceph Distributed Storage. And if you're already familiar with Ceph, you've been using it for a while, and you really want to dive deep, uh, this webinar will be presented by Sage Weil, who's the creator of Ceph and Ink Tank CTO. So this is kind of a really great webinar for those of you that want in-depth information. Okay. So if you'd like to contact us to follow up, you know, there's going to be links in the webinar uh, emails, but you can also contact us uh, using info at .com or our phone number. And don't forget to follow us on Twitter. You can connect to us on Facebook and check out our channel on YouTube for how-to videos and more information. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your time and attention. Uh, we're about 50-some minutes into the webinar. Uh, let me hand it back to Danielle and see if we have time for questions or anything else. Thank you, Marisol. We, appreci we appreciate um, everyone taking out their time during their busy schedules to join today. Since we got so many questions, what we will do is put it into a Q&A and send it out to everyone who attended um, within the next couple of days. Um, there were just too many questions for us to handle. Um, the recording will be ready for you to review shortly, and um, please feel free to register for any of the upcoming webinars that we will be hosting, and contact us at any time at info at informatica.com if you have any questions. Um, thank you very much.